The most successful years of Rudyard Kipling's literary career were between 1889 and 1899 when he lived in America. Rudyard Kipling would have remained in America if certain circumstances had not forced him to leave. For him, there were only two places in the world where he'd rather live. They are Bombay and Brattleboro. Kipling rose to the top of not just English literature, but indeed the entire literary world. In 1907, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, becoming its youngest winner at age 41 and the first in the English language. Not only is his work hardly read today but also read within the context of colonial India rather than his ancestral home, England. But, in fact, Kipling's most prodigious and creative period took place in America, which was also his preferred home. It was here, on the crest of a Vermont hillside overlooking the Connecticut River, that Kipling wrote both The Jungle Book and Captain's Courageous. His most rapid ascent to fame also happened here. Had a family dispute not forced his departure in 1896, he would have stayed in the United States. He saw himself not just as an American, but a particularly American artist. Steeped in the history of the Gilded Age, Christopher Benfee brings to life in fresh revelatory detail American Kipling, tracing a great but today deeply unfashionable writer's intense personal, political, and artistic involvement with the United States. Kim, Kipling's shimmering novel of international intrigue and spiritual quest, is a favorite for countless readers, young and old. Tilda Christopher Benfee. He offers an overdue reminder of Kipling's extraordinary influence in his own lifetime, as well as a compelling portrait of the American artists and writers he both influenced and was influenced by, including William James and, in particular, Mark Twain, who Kipling sought out specifically as kindred spirit when he first arrived, and before long had eclipsed in literary fame and critical estimation. Intertwining biography, criticism, and history, if, restores a true story of great American artistry. The major highlights of this historical account are shared in the following chapters. Did you know? Rudyard Kipling was born in Bombay in 1865 and educated in England. From around 1890 to 1920, he was the most popular and financially successful writer in the world. Kipling found the elusive Mark Twain in Elmira, New York and dazzled him with his mastery of the English language like a denizen of the moon. As a young reporter, Kipling was fond of Mark Twain's books and set out to find him at all cost. After a long and arduous journey, he traversed 14,000 miles to find Mark Twain sequestered from the public's eye in Elmira, New York. Kipling was 23 years old at the time. The meeting was in August, 1889. Kipling was a reporter for the Allahabad Pioneer, in remote India. That meeting marked the beginning of a close friendship between the two. While Twain didn't allow reporters more than a few minutes with him, he was mesmerized by Kipling's command of language. Twain said Kipling's talk which might be likened to footprints, so strong and definite was the impression which it left behind. He was astonished by Kipling's breadth of knowledge. Kipling got Twain's daughter, Susie, transfixed by his exotic accent and extraordinary talk of faraway lands. She felt that she was listening to, a denizen of the moon. Twain was interested in the story behind the outlandish name, Rudyard, the exotic accent, and how he became a reporter for the Indian newspaper. His odd first name was easily explained. His father, John Lockwood Kipling, was trained as a sculptor and potter, and employed at the Staffordshire Potteries around present, day Stoke, on, Trent. His mother, Alice, was visiting her brother in the neighborhood, and joined a holiday party for a picnic at Lake Rudyard. It was there that Kipling's parents met and fell in love, and they commemorated the occasion when they named their first child Joseph Rudyard Kipling. The American Civil War, which figured so prominently in Twain's life, also had a bearing on Kipling's early years. The naval blockade of the Confederacy prevented southern cotton from reaching England, opening markets to Indian cotton instead. In 1865, the last year of the war, Lockwood and Alice, pregnant with their first child, moved to Bombay, flush with the cotton trade, where Lockwood took a job teaching art and design at a newly founded school. It was in England, where Kipling and his younger sister, Trix, were farmed out to a harsh foster family, that Kipling first discovered the world of books. His father sent him, Robinson Crusoe, and the brothers Grimm, without realizing that his miserable son was living a fairy tale, part Hansel and Gretel, and part Little Red Riding Hood. Four years at a second-rate private school, mainly for the children of military officers, followed. Diminutive, dark-skinned, bespectacled, Kipling was an exotic figure to his classmates, he shocked his teachers by announcing that his favorite poet was the disreputable Walt Whitman. To Kipling and his friends, America, the land of Tom Sawyer and Uncle Remus, seemed a place of mischief and boyish high spirits. Too poor for college, Kipling returned to India for a job with a local newspaper in Lahore, the northern outpost now in Pakistan, where his father had become director of the art school and museum. During what he called his seven years hard as a newspaper reporter in northern India, Kipling remade himself as a tough-minded observer of the life of ordinary soldiers. He followed British troops on their sometimes dangerous missions along the Afghan border and watched, with an eagle eye, the behavior of the British colonial community at work and at play. Soon he began publishing short stories and poems based on these experiences, garnering a local readership for his racy accounts of local life, in a pulp series for travelers called the Indian Railway Library. In 1889, seeking a broader scope for his work, Kipling began his epic journey around the world and gradually transformed himself into an international writer. 
He traveled to Hong Kong and Japan. Most importantly, he traveled to the United States, where his dream of restoring something of the wondrous early life he had led as a child, in Bombay, took hold. Part of that dream was to meet Mark Twain. Kipling had a mysterious scheme which involved the Minuteman statue and a silent vigil at Longfellow's grave. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a poet in Kipling's American Parnassus that matched Mark Twain in prose. Kipling admired Longfellow for three things in particular. First, Longfellow's appeal to a broad range of readers was something that Kipling sought to emulate from the start. Second, Kipling followed Longfellow in repurposing inherited forms like the ballad. One of the first poems that Kipling was drawn to, when he tried his hand at writing verses as a schoolboy, was the seductive meter of Hiawatha, which, as he noted wryly in Something of Myself, saved all the bother about rhyme. And third, Longfellow was an emphatically cosmopolitan writer, bringing all sorts of national traditions, Italian, Spanish, German, Scandinavian, and even Native American, into his work. Longfellow was a world poet in ways that Bombay-born Kipling aspired to. All three of these literary commitments, to wide popularity, to popular forms, and to diverse national traditions, were mutually reinforcing. During the ensuing months, Kipling worked on a story based on the Indian theme of metempsychosis, or the transmigration of souls, while specifically engaging both the themes of Longfellow's poetry and its very nature as a reverberating echo chamber. The statue of the Minuteman, on the other hand, aligned with Kipling's love for the military. In his letter to Ted Hill, his friend, he indicated that the Minuteman statue commemorated the very beginning of things for him. He saw this statue at Concord, the home of many of the American writers he most admired and also the site of the first major battlefield of the American Revolution. The Minuteman's statue is that of an American rebel, Daniel Chester French. It depicts him as having one hand on the plow where he has left his coat, while the other resolutely holds his flintlock rifle. This picture signifies a man visibly leaving one way of life for another, more daring one, and at a minute's notice. Four days before going to Concord, Kipling had been in Wellesley, west of Boston to visit a druggist's store and also meet Caroline Taylor, whom he was hoping to marry. Taylor was enrolled as a special student at the famous women's college. She was religiously devout and knew little of the world beyond Beaver, Pennsylvania. The allure for Kipling was simply that she was Ted Hill's younger sister. As Kipling traveled from Elmira to Washington, D.C., he found a lot of similarities between America and India. His curiosity in American military grew since he had covered the military in India. He poked around Army headquarters and met a cavalry officer who had special interest in the Native Americans of Arizona and New Mexico. From Philadelphia where he found three parses staying at his hotel, he went to New York to track down the artist Lockwood de Forest at his father's request. The two Lockwoods had set up an export business in teak furniture carved by native craftsmen. DeForest urged Kipling to visit Joseph Henry Harper, head of the Harper and Brothers firm. He found from Harper that his literary skills were surplus to requirements. Turning to a long-lost uncle, Henry MacDonald, the black sheep of his mother's siblings, Kipling found that he, too, had not been successful in New York. These encounters made him want to leave New York post-haste. Kipling had a long-standing encounter with psychical research in the realm of the paranormal. One of Kipling's most admired stories, The Finest Story in the World, begins with a chance meeting between an older, established writer and a 20-year-old bank clerk named Charlie Mears in a London pool hall. Mears had literary aspirations, and an apprenticeship developed between them. There is an odd interlude in The Finest Story in the World when the narrator is tempted to consult a professional mesmerist. He wants to see if Mears might be prompted, under hypnosis, to speak of his past lives. By chance, he encounters a Bengali law student he knows casually, someone familiar with Hindu notions of reincarnation, and seeks his advice. It is of course an old tale with us, Grish Chunder remarks, but to happen to an Englishman, that would indeed be rare. Chunder suggests that the narrator might pour the ink pool into his hand, a reference to a method of divination known as scrying, in which patterns are discerned in tea leaves or a crystal ball, since Mears is clearly a seer and he will tell us very many things. Kipling was thoroughly familiar with Indian ideas of reincarnation and divination. He had also read widely in contemporary attempts, in both England and America, to uncover evidence of paranormal abilities, mentioning in one early story the research of Frederick Myers, founder of the British Society for Psychical Research, and his popular book Phantasms of the Living 1886. Apart from the shenanigans of certain professional spiritualists, fakery involving secret signals, hidden trapdoors, and disguised voices, there was a serious side to this research. It was part of an ongoing attempt to make room, in a scientific and materialist age, for religious faith, and specifically for phenomena that could not be explained by material causes alone. Thinkers like William James were eager to reveal fraud in order to explore more aggressively what might just possibly be true, such as claims of telepathy a word coined by Myers in 1882 or dreams that predicted the future. Mark Twain joined the Society for Psychical Research on the basis of just such a dream. With its own rich traditions of meditation, yoga, and other spiritual practices, India was a seedbed of paranormal claims and a favored destination for Westerners drawn to the wisdom of the East, tilde Christopher Benfi. European sojourners gave their own interpretive twist to Hindu ideas of reincarnation, grafting pseudo-Darwinian notions of spiritual evolution to ancient beliefs regarding the progress of human souls. 
Simla, the summer retreat that Washington resembled, became a center for such roving pilgrims and practitioners. The Kipling family, sojourning in Simla to escape the dangerous summer heat, had a close-up view of some of the exotic claimants to spiritual superiority. Madame Blavatsky, the Russian-born founder of Theosophy and a firm believer in reincarnation, was the foremost of these. At one time our little world was full of the aftermaths of Theosophy as taught by Madame Blavatsky to her devotees, Kipling recalled in, Something of Myself. My father knew the lady and, with her, would discuss wholly secular subjects, she being, he told me, one of the most interesting and unscrupulous impostors he had ever met. Her trickery was evident to the researchers from the Society for Psychical Research who traveled to Simla to investigate but not before the head editor of the Allahabad Pioneer, for which Kipling wrote, had turned the newspaper into a propaganda organ for theosophy. Kipling's early story in the House of Sudhu concerns a scam perpetrated by a spiritualist fraud. And yet Kipling was not a firm disbeliever in spiritualism either. Both his mother and his mentally unstable sister, Trix, were said to have clairvoyant powers, the gift of second sight. Kipling suspected something of the same capacity in himself. He was once asked if he believed that there was anything to spiritualism. There is, I know, Kipling answered, have nothing to do with it. Kipling's sister, as it turned out, would have a lot to do with it. For Charlie Mears, Longfellow was the medium in which his memory worked best. Under the American poet's influence, the jarring cross-currents of the echo chamber of English poetry were, momentarily, dumb. Medium and cross-currents suggest a variety of spiritualism that tricks, ten years after the publication of her brother's famous story, fully embraced. The discovery of Kipling by Charles Walcott Ballastier set in motion the marriage of Rudyard Kipling to his sister, Carrie Ballastier. After attempting several businesses without success, Charles Walcott Ballastier established himself as a publisher. He represented individual authors and co-founded the firm Heinemann and Ballastier with the German-English publisher William Heinemann. His search for a new Indian writer made him cross path with Kipling and he immediately found that Kipling was precisely the kind of author he was looking for. Within a year, he had published a volume of Kipling's Indian stories, Mine Own People, in the United States. Ballastier's mindfulness of the marketplace made him convince Kipling to try his luck with a novel. The Light That Failed was written in haste and a second version was written for an American audience. This version became a cult bible for younger American writers of the 1890s. Such as Stephen Crane and Willa Cather as they attempted to resist mere commercialism in their own careers. Ballastier died after a brief illness on December 6, 1891. Shortly after his burial, on January 18, 1892, Carrie Ballastier married Rudyard Kipling in what seemed like an extension of the burial of her brother. Carrie and her sister Josephine had grown fond of Kipling who spent a lot of time in their home while their brother was alive. On February 2, the Kiplings left London on the first leg of their projected around-the-world honeymoon. Before his death, Charles Ballastier set in motion what would constitute the rise to stardom for Rudyard Kipling in America. Thus, he found out when he got news from the McDonald's that his uncle in New York had throat cancer and he had to visit him. Although his uncle had died by the time he got to America, the attention his arrival pulled as reporters flocked around him revealed that the Kipling name was increasing in popularity in America. This fame is due in large part to Charles Ballastier's visionary and entrepreneurial spirit. The new couple went on a tour around the world for their honeymoon but the camaraderie was truncated by a financial crisis. On board the British steamer Empress of India from Vancouver, the Rudyard and Carrie Kipling arrived at the port city of Yokohama, Japan on April 20, 1892. Japan was the third leg of their honeymoon, and the most eagerly anticipated. After a brief stopover in New York, the young couple had paused in Brattleboro, where they impulsively bought a few acres of land from Carrie's brother, Beatty, as they contemplated a possible vacation house in Vermont. For Carrie Kipling, Japan had a special significance. Her maternal grandfather, Erasmus Peshine Smith, was an expert in banking and international law. He was the first foreign advisor hired by the emperor, or Mikado, to help Japan, long isolated from the West, catch up with the modern world. Rising sharply above the busy streets of Yokohama, and buffered from the crowds by a canal lined with boats, stood the fashionable bluff, where Europeans and Americans had their homes, their exclusive private clubs, and their cemetery. It was here, after a few nights at the Grand Hotel, that the Kiplings settled in, welcomed into the home of a friendly English merchant, E.J. Hunt, and his wife, whom they had met on their passage from Vancouver. They made us more than welcome in their house, Kipling wrote, and saw to it that we should see Japan in Wisteria and Peony time. Seeing Japan entailed visits to the curio shops and photographer's studios of Yokohama. It also meant the obligatory side trip to Nikko, the mountain resort to the north where the Tokugawa shoguns, the fierce warlords who had ruled Japan during its centuries of isolation, were buried. They spent a night in Tokyo en route to Nikko, but not long enough, as Kipling explained to the young British attaché, Cecil Spring Rice, for social calls. To the south, they visited the baths at picturesque Miyanoshita, a craggy resort of pine-forested cliffs in view of Mount Fuji. While in Japan, the Kiplings experienced two earthquakes. The 3RD earthquake for Rudyard Kipling was a figurative one. On June 9, 1892, he went to the Yokohama branch of his bank to withdraw money for one of his sightseeing excursions. Afraid of a thief, he chose to ignore the advice of the manager to withdraw more. 
When he returned to the bank later in the day, there was an alarming notice on the door informing customers that the bank had suspended payment. Like a tsunami, news of the financial disaster hit the Kiplings unannounced. Carrie's own grandfather had established the foundations of Japanese banking. And now, those foundations were shaken to the core. The tremor of 1892, and the global instability that culminated in the Panic of 1893, reverberated around the world. Kipling's entire fortune was in the bank. Flat broke, he was about to be a father. It was time for the honeymooners, however reluctantly, to cut their journey short. Thomas Cook's travel agency generously granted them two return vouchers to Vancouver, en route to Vermont. The Kiplings begin again in a cottage home which Rudyard describes as a figurative nose arc and where he wrote nose arc tales. With help from Anna Ballastier, Carrie's mother, the Kiplings were able to secure a small cottage at Bliss Farm, down the road from Maplewood. Shortly after they winterized the house, their first child, Josephine, was born on December 28, 1892. Soon after his arrival in Brattleboro, Kipling wrote to Mary Mapes Dodge, editor of the popular American children's magazine St. Nicholas, to propose a batch of new stories, destined for an eventual book, under the title, Noah's Ark Tales. The biblical story of Noah, that epic of devastation on a grand scale followed, under the sign of the rainbow, by new and hopeful beginnings, had crystallized in Kipling's mind as singularly appropriate to his own precarious situation in his newly adopted country. Josephine Kipling was given an actual toy Noah's Ark, accompanied by 126 animal and human figures, when she was 18 months old. It was a gift from Kipling's Aunt Louisa Baldwin, presented on a visit the Kiplings made to England to visit his parents, during the summer of 1894. A toy nose arc much like Josephine's appears in Kipling's devastating early story, Ba Ba, Black Sheep. The story was widely assumed to be fictional, although Aunt Louis would have known the truth, until the posthumous publication of Kipling's autobiography, Something of Myself. Ba Ba, Black Sheep is a fictional representation of the experiences of Rudyard and his sister, Trix, when they were farmed out to live with a foster mother in England by their parents. Meanwhile, Rudyard and Carrie, long confined to Tiny Bliss Cottage, were envisioning a dream house for their family. The plan for the house resembled a houseboat perched on the hillside like Noah's Ark on Ararat. The house, to be called Nalika in honor of Walcott Ballastier, would merge memories of India with Kipling's fresh sense of Vermont. Many of the ideas for the house came from Kipling himself, but he needed a sympathetic architect to realize them. He was fortunate to have Henry Rutgers Marshall, a student of the great American architect H. H. Richardson, as his creative partner. Soon enough, Nalika itself became a destination for pilgrims, especially literary ones, eager to pay their respects to Kipling at his hillside refuge. Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes arrived at Nalika in November 1894. Other notable pilgrims include Bliss Carman, Owen Wister, and Frank Doubleday. The visit from Conan Doyle activated yet another aspect of Kipling's fixation on Noah's Ark. Conan Doyle was a Freemason, and so, as it happened, was Kipling, who had joined the half-secret organization, inspired by medieval guilds of craftsmen, during his early years in India. There are degrees in Freemasonry, and on April 14, 1887, Kipling was promoted to the rank of Royal Ark Mariner, with Mount Ararat Mariner's Lodge No. 98 in Lahore. The Royal Ark is closely allied to the Mark degree, which Kipling received the same day, and which also employs the symbolism of Noah's Ark. Kipling's elevation to the status of Royal Ark Mariner coincided with the writing of Ba Ba, Black Sheep, with its toy Noah's Ark, and The Man Who Would Be King, his parable of imperial overreach, which employs Masonic ritual. It also reinforced the importance of Noah's Ark as his own private symbol. Did you know? Kipling was five years old when he and his sister were farmed out to a sadistic foster mother in the south of England. Conclusion Rudyard Kipling was one of a kind. An imperialist who used his literary skills to shape the Gilded Age. His many works continue to have deep relevance in the literary world and in global politics. The events in his life constituted the inspiration for his poems, short stories and novels. He had a close relationship with those who ruled America in the 20th century and he undoubtedly influenced their decisions and actions in more than one way. His childhood trauma, financial losses, and loss of his children, Josephine and Jack, shaped his career in life. The death of his daughter at eight years old caused him to part with America for good. Alongside Mark Twain, he was given an honorary degree at Oxford despite not having gone to college. At age 41, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature and became the most accomplished man in the literary world of his time. Pneumonia that caused permanent damage to his lungs drove him to a warmer climate during the winter season. It was during this time that he developed his jingoistic support for English colonists in the Boer War in South Africa. Truly, it is impossible to tell the story of 20th century America without recognizing the significant impact of Joseph Rudyard Kipling. Try this, Kipling was an imperialist. It is known that at some point he considered America's colonization of the Philippines as the white man's burden. The events in the life of Kipling might have informed his love for imperialism. What would you have recommended if you were in Kipling's shoes?